Thank you for inviting me to come to Taos and give a program. One of the things that's always been very close to my heart is uh, landscaping with native plants. I grew up on a wholesale nursery in East Texas in Beaumont that was family owned since 1886, you know. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, passed down from generation to generation, the horticultural part of it. And I got very interested in uh, the native plant aspect of landscaping. I'm not a landscaper, um, but I love native plants. So uh, that's why I've, back in the 80s when we first started, uh, the emphasis on landscaping with native plants, um, I wrote this book that is now in the second edition, uh, no longer just Texas and the Southwest. There's a separate book for Texas and one for the Southwest, which is Arizona and New Mexico. Well, over the years and the decades, um, native plants and landscaping with native plants has really become a national initiative. Um, I think now the, the more money is spent on bird seeds and wildlife watching and binoculars than on, on hunting and, and guns. Uh, so that's uh, kind of an interesting uh, use, non-consumptive use of, of nature that I think is very important. Uh, and that's part of the whole landscaping with native plant uh, effort. Um, there's actually um, the University of Texas, which now operates the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center and the uh, and also the National Wildlife Federation have certification programs uh, for creating ha habitat in your backyard that supports wildlife. Uh, even the Texas Parks and Wildlife and Game and Fish that, you know, their emphasis like most Game and Fish has always been on hunting and fishing. Now they have a wildscapes program, which came from my first book on native plants, uh, on certifying backyards that have 50% native plants and a source of food and water a year round for wildlife. So creating wildlife in backyards is, is a very popular and um, important issue, I think, particularly in the native plant movement. So what it comes down to is if you put out the backyard welcome mat, which means native plants, uh, then the, back, the wildlife will come. And this is the little ground squirrel that jumped up on my window last year and looked in the window to see what was going on. And I thought, well, he's telling me to get out and fill the feeders up, you know, and maybe he was. <laughs> but um, uh, native plants have always been, uh, like I said, very close to my heart. And why, and as the landscape movement has gotten more and more popular and more, uh, it's always the question, still is there is why landscape with native plants. And I think one of the main reasons, four of the main reasons I have listed here. And the first one is to save on water. And this started back in the 80s. I think Denver coined the term xeriscaping. And uh, they weren't really thinking about native plants necessarily at this point, they're just low water consumption plants. Because there's not enough water in the West. Um, for, there's agriculture and industry and urban use, municipal use. And for agriculture, 80% of the water that's used in the West is used for agriculture. It takes 2,900 gallons of water to make a quarter pound beef patty and uh, 250 gallons of water to produce a quart of milk. And here's where it really hurts, 66 gallons of water to make a glass of wine. But um, <laughs> so I know all, all of you are becoming teetotalers now and vegetarians, you know. But, but that, that really speaks to our culture and our lifestyle of, of our water consumption. Uh, then as people started talking about native plants more, it was like, well, you can save, not only save water, you can have less maintenance because the native plants have evolved together with the climate, with the soil. Uh, they can stand, withstand the, you know, the blazing summers and the freezing winters and the droughts uh, and still survive. So you don't have to spend as much money uh, either as homeowners or as you know commercial landscapes in replacing plants and maintaining plants. 
Then there's the idea of creating a sense of place. And Lady Bird Johnson is famous for saying that she wants Texas to look like Texas and New York to look like New York and California to look like California. Uh, we have a strong sense of place in the Southwest and in New Mexico. But you know, it takes more than just hanging a, turning off your sprinklers and planting a cactus or hanging a ristro on your patio uh, to really embrace the Southwest. And so that's one thing we can do with native plants is uh, show that, uh, make the beauty of the Southwest reflected in our landscapes. And as recently now, it's been more and more important, uh, the emphasis in the whole native plant uh, movement has been to repair the environment. And uh, as urban cities expand, um, more and more uh, habitat is destroyed. Um, see this little red house here? I live about a block away from that. This used to be pristine desert, and now it's Dale Webb is building a thousand homes, uh, and it butts up right up against the Petroglyph National Monument. Uh, so uh, in this area here, I've spent a lot of time just walking through here and hiking and looking at the plants. It was a half a block from my house. And there were probably 50 or 60 species of, of wildflowers, annuals and perennials of shrubs and subshrubs, of grasses, and all of the you know, animals and pollinators uh, that lived in that community. And then in a matter of you know, weeks and months, all that has been scraped clean and it's been uh, replaced by you know, cement streets and, and turf lawns and gravel lawns. Uh, so there's really an exotic plant. So the, the habitat has been destroyed. So I feel like a real responsibility and a real emphasis in, with native plants is to repair the environment so we can share the environment. 80% um, on the nationwide studies show that 80% of plants used in landscapes, both private and commercial, are exotic. And that means they don't provide any, uh, really any sustainable substance for the wildlife which is really a shame because just in Taos County alone, there's over a thousand plants, species and varieties. And of that, probably several hundred at least would make really good landscape plants in the yard. They have flowers, uh, ornate bark, evergreen leaves or leaves that turn colors in the fall. So a lot of ornate qualities that would really be adapted to uh, thrive in our yards. And, and by doing that, it would also support the habitat. So really what we're talking about uh, when we are talking about landscaping now and landscaping with native plants is to create an oasis in your yard. Turn your yard into an oasis for wildlife. And it's really a, a new paradigm for landscaping. No longer are we just talking about you know, putting some gravel out or planting a specimen plant and a foundation hedge around the house, you know, it, these all look good and are the basic design strategies of landscape uh, designers. Uh, but, you know, we want to go a little farther than that and create a habitat that repairs the environment and provides uh, something that will keep our pollinators and our wildlife populations from crashing. Um, one reason this works back the whole idea of a backyard oasis you know this my yard is the traditional plot you know 60 by 100 or 90 by 100 something like that uh, and yet i have probably 20 species of birds every month visiting my yard uh, pollinate you know lots of pollinators coming to the, fl the flowers i planted um, so uh, you can do this it doesn't take a, a huge big you know acreage to do it of course the bigger the better but the reason this works is because wildlife live in what ecologists call a patchy environment. They have to, they have to go around their whole territory and they find, you know, one little hillside with some flowers on it. Or, you know, along a, a, a arroya that has gotten a little impulse of water from a rain and the flowers are blooming. So they find these little sources of food and, they, you know, they're regularly making these rounds going from place to place where they are found 
uh, habitat that can support them. And so we can do that in our yard. We can make our yard as part of that regular route that they make. Um, but uh, to do that, there's some things we need to be aware of. That's kind of what I want to talk about tonight, is what we need to do to create an oasis in our backyard. Uh, the things that wildlife need are water and food and shelter. You know, these, the, you know, the, the foraging wildlife need these three things at least. Migrating birds need these three things. Uh, they're very important. But if we're going to have a sustainable population of pollinators particularly, <clears throat> since the bees and the butterfly populations have really uh, decreased in the last decade, we need to have nest sites uh, and host plants for the larvae of the caterpillar and the moths. So one thing we can have is, the, the, the first thing to look at is having a water feature in our yard. And this, on all the certification programs, you know, this is the number one thing, having a water feature, particularly in the West, where uh, water is, is a real attractant. Birds like trickling water, so I got this fountain from the internet, a solar fountain that has a, a little water pump in the bottom basin there and a, a long cord going out with a, um, a little solar panel. So it has this little trickling water and the birds love it. Um, uh, birds also love just a plain old ordinary traditional bird bath. Um, as you can see here, they, uh, they like to be social bathers too. And so they'll, two or three of them will get into the bird bath and uh, have a, a, you know, a party in the hot tub. Um, bees like shallow standing water, so a bird bath kind of helps that too. Uh, butterflies like a puddle, like water on the ground, saturated soil. And so the, the birds here are helping, helping along with that requirement too. But you know, you can be real simple with it. If you have a drip system, just put a shallow pan on the ground with a meter in it. And every time that it comes on for the cycle, it fills up with water. You know, some spills over and provides water for the butterflies. And then the shallow water helps for the birds and the uh, bees. Um, another real important factor is for food is plant diversity particularly with uh, pollinators. Uh, they, this is really important to have a, a wide variety of plants. Uh, insects come in all shapes and sizes and uh, so do plants. They come in all shapes and sizes. So what, they're, uh, what you want to do is provide uh, three seasons of flowering. Uh, so there's, you know, like the yarrows are already starting to bloom uh, and early spring and a lot of the shrubs, like you talk about the cliff rose and uh, some of these others, the shrubs bloom early because they, they already have the, the, the plant there. All they need to do is produce buds and they've got flowers. Uh, you know, annuals and perennials have to, well, herbaceous perennials have to start from the roots and build up. So, uh, so it's important to have some shrubs involved that give early blooming. And then in the summer, you've got the, the milkweeds, um, you know, the aster families. Uh, and then as summer progresses, we get the monsoons and we have a no, whole new bloom come along with the chemises and goldenrods. And these provide uh, late summer and fall source of food, of nectar and pollen. And this is real important because the, most of the bees, solitary bees, uh, put their eggs in burrows or in a hose they drill in wood or, and uh, then put a little ball of pollen in there for the, for the larva to eat when they hatch. So this, the fall blooming plants are real important as a source of fall pollen for the nests. Another important feature is mass planting. Uh, in my yard, like I said, it's just a small yard, but I have like three or four oval gardens that are not much bigger than this table but I'll plant a whole lot of plants in there and uh, you'll get, they'll end up with uh, a nice bloom, a variety of bloom, uh, flowers blooming at the same time. Uh, in nature, it's all about energy efficiency. So a bee doesn't have to fly, you know, a hundred yards between one flower and the other. Uh, they can 
uh, just hop from one flower to, you know, one flower to the next. Plants have evolved this strategy to help bees and pollinators uh, by having a lot of flowers together on a stem, on, you know, like the penstemons, and, and growing uh, in mass like this. So that's something else to consider is uh, having some area in your yard where you can plant a lot of, uh, just a mass of flowers. Uh, plus, you know, it looks nice. You know, I'm the only, my yard is the only yard in the subdivision that has flowers blooming from early spring all the way into the fall. And I've had people say, oh, you live in that house with all the flowers. Yeah, you know, that's native plants will keep, will color scape your yard all season long. So that's kind of a, a dual uh, benefit. Um, another thing to watch for, that, to plan for, and this new paradigm, you know, we're thinking about all these different th processes that landscapes can provide. And one is shelter. Uh, we need a diversity of height uh, from, you know, tall trees, tall bushes, big bushes, to, you know, smaller perennials, to ground covers. Uh, also, we need uh, bare ground and complete cover. Uh, solitary bees nest in bare ground. They drill their holes down in the ground uh, and lay their eggs in that. So they need that. And maybe you've seen the bee, bees swarming around the ground this time of year. Uh, that's the males waiting for the females to emerge so they can mob them. Um, um, that's what it's all about. Uh, but, you know, birds, desert birds particularly, a lot of them are, are ground foragers, there's not a whole lot of trees, you know, so they scratch around in leaf litter. So you need some cover like that also if you're going to uh, attract a variety. Uh, and sunny to shady, you know, butterflies like morning sun, a lot of birds like to get out in the sun. Uh, I have uh, sparrows that will get out and dust bathe and just spread out, you know, and, and doves will do that. So uh, sunny, uh, and shade at this also in, in your yard. Um, so one thing that's really important, I think, is, is like I said, there's uh, a, having a variety of ground covers. The, around the outside wall of my yard, or on the inside of the wall, uh, I have a couple of feet that I just let leaf litter uh, uh, gather, and um, that gives the birds, the ground foraging birds, something to scratch for because it grows, you know, we started an ecosystem here. We've got insects and bugs and spiders and grubs and worms that are growing in this litter. And the robins, I've seen robins come out of nowhere, pull up an earthworm. I said, well, how did that earthworm get in my yard? Or the curbbell threshers, they'll dig down to where their heads are underground, they're digging so deep, and one time they went and pulled up a grub that was like as big as the end of my thumb, and it swatted around on the ground, and uh, it took him like 10 minutes to eat it. But the, there's a whole ecosystem developing there, and it starts from the ground up. One thing that um, we need to really be aware of that really, to me, enriches this whole experience, I like to just sit out in my backyard uh, in, in, in the shade of my umbrella and, and watch everything that's going on. And there's many animals are adapted to specific flower types. So this is again why you want to have a variety, a diversity of flowers. Like the Palmer's Pinstemon. It's developed for bumblebees, evolved for bumblebees, and bumblebees have evolved for it. So bumblebees are real hairy, this thing that bees do, they're the, one of the biggest pollinators. They have real hairy bodies and hairy legs, and this is to transport pollen. So the, the inflated round tube of the flower is just the right size for a bumblebee to crawl inside. Uh, and I don't know if you can see, but there's the anthers that have the pollen are right across the top. There's four of them, two on each side. So when the bumblebee crawls in, well, the first thing he hits is the pistol and it picks up pollen that's already on his back. So you get to, you get to cross pollination. And then these dust his back with, or her back, with more pollen. And these guidelines here are directing the animal right back to the back where the nectar glands are, the nectaries. So they'll collect the nectar. Um, 
I don't know if you can see there's a little so, so that's the, the interior part of the flower that's evolved for bumblebee pollination. Uh, the, there's little glands all over the flower, hair, that's, uh, that's probably to keep pollen thieves out, ants. That kind of deters the ants from crawling in and stealing all the pollen and not, do, not pollinating because there's always cheaters around. You know, that's one thing that uh, happens in every system like this. So pentstemons are really wonderful plants. Uh, I like to have as many as I can. I have two or three different kinds in my yard. Uh, small tubes or like this or for small bees. Actually, that says small right there. F for small bees, the large uh, tubes are for bumblebees. And uh, then the red ones are for hummingbirds. And we'll talk about that in a second, how the hummingbirds adap at are adapted. Uh, long tubular plants like the datura are, need pollinators with real long tongues, uh, particularly the hawk moths. And hawk moths are very efficient pollinators uh, and they'll fly for square, you know, square miles all around looking for night blooming flowers. Uh, evening primroses, you know, the evening part of it is that they're open all night and many of them are white. Uh, so this so they can be seen in the moonlight. So something else that's just kind of starting to catch on, I'm gonna write an article for the next newsletter on moon gardens. So p people planting, planting species that are specifically designed for moth pollination. And moths are one of the most efficient pollinators. Butterflies, not so much. Moths do a lot of pollination, like the yucca moth that pollinates uh, yuccas, a very specific adaptation. Um, columbines um, have, attract a wide variety of pollinators with long tongues. The pollen is, the uh, nectar is in these spurs right at the end, and so the animal has to have a long enough tongue to get down into it. Uh, a lot of the moths that are active at night, like they are attracted to white for sure, but also light colors, like very light pinks and, and yellows. Uh, bees don't see red, but they see blue real well. And so they're attracted particularly to, to blue flowers and darker colored flowers. Uh, so that's probably bumblebee pollination here. They'll uh, land in there and stick their, you know, their tongues. They have pretty long tongues also. I'm not sure what pollinates it, but uh, blue flowers too tend to be uh, from bumblebees or bees. And then of course the red uh, comes from, they're pollinated by hummingbirds. So a hummingbird hovers down here, flies in and sticks its bill up in here and its tongue to get down to the nectar. And when it does that, all the pollen is out here. And that just douses him with pollen when he comes in or she comes in uh, to pollinate. Well, sh uh, short tongue insects need shallow flowers to, uh, to get the nectar from and the pollen from. Uh, a lot of the members of the aster family, the daisy family, have these rays around the outside, showy rays, and these are the billboards that says, come to me, you'll like me. <laughs> and, and then in the middle are the flowers that are little tubular flowers, uh, just uh, packed in there, you know, dozens and dozens of little tubular flowers. Uh, so the bees and, and other small uh, insects that have uh, a short tongue are particularly adapted for those. Well, it turns out flies are very efficient pollinators too, and there's lots and lots of kinds of flies, you know, from tiny, tiny little flies, you know, to the, you know, the big flies we see uh, that are more obvious. You can tell a fly from a bee, you know how to do that? Well, the easiest way, there's several antinomical ways, but the easiest way is look at the antennas. And flies have real stubby little antennas like that. They also have, have two wings and bees have four wings, but it's kind of hard to see when they're flying by. Um, um, so beetles are also important pollinators. These guys just kind of like the bull in the ch china shop. They, you know, crawl all over the flower getting the nectar and the pollen and um, you can see this one, how covered with pollen it is. Uh, uh, 
uh, so they're pretty indiscriminate in, in gathering pollen. Um, but they'll, a lot of the flowers are, tra are pollinated by beetles. Matter of fact, the uh, uh, butterfly milkweed, the, the orange one that's so popular, I'll have a picture of it in a minute, that's pollinated by beetles, not butterflies. Butterflies aren't adapted for pollination. They don't have hairy wing uh, legs. They do not have hairy bodies. They have long legs that stand up on top of the flower and their tongue goes down to get it. Um, then they lay their, they get, so they get the nectar. Then they lay their eggs on the, a plant and the larvae eat the plant. So, uh, so they have a different position in the web, food web and in the ecosystem than pollination as their primary factor. Another way that uh, plants are adapted specifically to pollinators, we've seen that they are, you know, colors are uh, effective or adapted, the size of the plants adapted, but also the blooming time. Uh, and I mentioned this earlier, the uh, four o'clock family and the evening primrose family uh, typically open in the call it four o'clock because they open at four o'clock not five o'clock, <laughs> four o'clock, and then they are open all night for pollination, and then in the, by early morning or mid-morning, they're closed. And usually the flowers only last one day, so uh, they, it's important for them to uh, attract the, the bees or the moths, mostly the moths, in that one time period. So a lot of them are very fragrant and uh, they'll waft their perfume on the breezes and moths can actually be attracted to it from a mile away. So it's a very efficient system. Birds also are important pollinators, uh, mainly hummingbirds. And for hummingbirds, there's something called the hummingbird syndrome, which is a set of characteristics that plants have designed to attract hummingbirds. And the first one, or maybe the most important one, is the color red. So all hummingbirds all key in on red plants. Uh, and any red plant you see that has the hummingbird syndrome will, you know, be hummingbird pollinated. Another one is it's tubular shaped, kind of about the length of the bill. So the hummingbird can insert its bill in there and stick its tongue out. If you've seen them, they have long tongues. And get it down to the nectary and get the, fly, get the nectar. And when they do that, um, they get pollen on them. And that goes from, from their bill to their heads, their throats, their shoulders. So that goes from one flower to the next. Um, so you can see when the, a hummingbird comes in and hovers, sticks his nose, his bill in there, uh, then it's going to, that's the pistil which receives the pollen and, inter, and pollinates the ovaries. And then deeper inside is the pollen producing anthers. Uh, a real popular ground cover that is, a, is the pine leaf pistamen that actually it's native to the mountains in southern New Mexico, uh, southwestern New Mexico. I've seen them on 10,000 foot ridges, so they're very temperature hardy. Uh, but they uh, produce, and they're evergreen ground cover, little woody plants. Uh, so it's a beautiful plant for your gardens and uh, really will attract, I mean, you can see the hummingbird there, uh, attract hummingbirds. You might not expect cactus to be pollinated by hummingbirds, but the uh, claret cup does. And again, these grow from 10,000 foot ridges all the way down into the desert. There's two species in New Mexico. This one is more of the northern species. But most cactus have flimsy flower petals that are kind of pointed, uh, lots of uh, yellow uh, st stamens to, with lots of pollen, and the bees just get in there and bathe around in it. Uh, but not the claret cups. They have a waxy, uh, firm petal that's actually kind of rounded, and that's a hummingbird can, it's firm enough for a hummingbird to perch on it. So it has a little perch there. Then when the hummingbird, and red anthers, red pollen, when the hummingbird plunges its head down into bill down to, to get to the nectar at the bottom, first thing it's going to hit is the stamen lobes, 
I mean the uh, stigma lobes, and it's going to pollinate it, and then it'll go down and get pollen from that particular flower. Um, a study in Arizona, four different flower types that were all uh, had the hummingbird syndrome, and they were curious of whether or not uh, the flowers just popped all the pollen onto the dusted the birds, and then every time they went, they would give a mixture of pollen to the next flower. So they started looking at it, and they found out that, no, that's not the way it works. It's much more nuanced than that. Uh, the salvias, uh, you can see the, the pistil sticking out here, and the, the stamens here with the pollen, and when the bird sticks its head in here, it's going to get pollen on the back of its head, and the pistil is going to only touch the back of its head. Uh, so that's very specific. On the pinstamens, it's sort of the op opposite. It gets the pollen right in the nose of it when it sticks it in there, and maybe on the bill. Uh, so it, it's a totally different place on the head. Uh, the cardinal flowers, the kind of, it's different too. The pistils, it maybe gets more on top of the head. Uh, and then monarda, I don't know if this is one of the flowers or not. I found that picture on the website. But you can see that it's... Uh, has a different placement of the pistils and the anthers so that the, when the bird goes into it, it's, the contact is, of each of those elements is going to be on a different part of the body. I just love these kind of features like that when you find out what's really going on in your backyard. It's like, you know, the magic and the mystery is all right there. Uh, it's Discovery Channel in your backyard. Well, for food, you need to have a dependable food supply. Uh, you can do that with pollinators by having, you know, a variety of blooming plants uh, throughout the seasons. Uh, hummingbirds, it's not yet easy to put up a hummingbird feeder. And when some of the, when the plants aren't in full bloom, uh, the hummingbirds will still have you on their stop as they come along. I can take my feeder down and uh, when I'm filling it up and a hummingbird will come sit there and hover right where it is, just waiting for me to bring it back. You've probably seen that if you have feeders. Uh, resident birds need food year-round, too. And um, I know um, winter, so it's important to have a food source in the winter, so, so particularly for the seed eaters. This is in my backyard, and the, uh, toe, the juncos come down from the sandias down to the to the desert area, have them all winter long, and the, the doves and the house finches are there, uh, all, all, you know, they're residents, nesting residents too. So having fo a food source year round is real important. Well, one thing let's talk about is um, what do you want for your butterfly garden? This seems to be really popular. There are lots of books written on butterfly gardens, so I thought I'd throw in just a little bit about. Uh, things to consider for a butterfly garden. This is the butterfly weed, the one that's uh, monarchs and queen butterflies lay their larva, lay their egg zone, and the larva eat the cardiac uh, uh, poisons in it so that when a bird eats it, it immediately gets sick. Uh, they've done tests with blue jays, uh, with, uh, you know, Innocent blue jays that didn't know that you shouldn't eat monarch butterflies. They're, they weren't raised very well. And they'll fly in, so they put them together in a cage, and the blue jays will fly in and take a nibble out of the wing and fly over and throw up. So, uh, so if you see, if you see uh, butterflies with little notches in their wings, you know, that, or monarchs particularly, uh, that's because they ran into a an unexperienced bird that tried to nip them. But anyway, uh, so it's there, these monitor, the uh, butterflies love milkweeds, not only for the copious amounts of nectar that they produce, but also uh, for their larva. Uh, and like I said, this is pollinated by beetles. Uh, Another thing butterfly gardens like is it's good to have a little sunny spot because they like to bask in the morning. You know, they're cold-blooded when they first wake up on a cool night, particularly like last night when Albuquerque was 40 degrees or whatever, and it's going to be 30 degrees tonight here. Uh, they like to get their muscles and their circulation going, their digestive 
enzymes pumping uh, by sitting in the sun and, and, and waking up, kind of like a hot shower for us, I guess. But so they need a place to bask in the sun. Uh, also, they need moist soil for, uh, to drink from, for water. And the males a lot of time will puddle, they call it puddling. They all get together around the puddle and, and talk with each other and, and whatever butterflies say, I don't know. But uh, I think probably almost every native plant is a host plant for some kind of butterfly or moth. Uh, I took this picture of the mountain mahogany to illustrate the seeds, they're very ornate seeds. Uh, and, and I looked at it and said, oh, I didn't pick a very pretty plant. Look, it's all chewed up. And then it dawned on me, well, yeah, it's because it's a host plant by, by uh, moths and butterflies. So the uh, two host plants that are common are the mountain mahogany hair streak and the Columbia silk moth. And they're both real interesting and beautiful uh, uh, pollinators. The juniper trees, we have those everywhere we look. Well, they're real important too for juniper hair streaks. Uh, you can see the, the that's the, the butterfly on a, on a milkweed, uh, but the egg is just a tiny little dot laying on, on the branch. Uh, the larva mimics the branch so that, you know, you would have to, you probably have walked by a thousand of them and never noticed it. Uh, and then in the winter, the berries are a really important food source for birds. Uh, so these are really multi-purpose plants. Um, the state butterfly, the two-tailed swallowtail, they fly through my yard all the time. They never land. Uh, but this, I have this ash tree in the backyard. Uh, Arizona ash is one of their host plants. Um, it's a bosky plant. Also, choke cherries and hop trees. Uh, they're both foothills plants uh, that are pretty wet, statewide in the foothills. Uh, so they, uh, that, that can be really important uh, for having those in your yard if you have them are, is, is real important. So, you know, if you give a plant the optimum habitat, it thrives. And um, actually, I think, you know, when you try to think like a plant, uh, you just can't do it. <laughs> you know, we can try this. This is my driveway, and it gets a little runoff from a roof. Uh, this is a little arroyo right here that fills up with water every time it rains. You know, there's a flash flood right down there every time it rains. Uh, the blowing sand accumulates in there, so this is the perfect place for a, a gallardia for the Indian blanket. Uh, and this came back for like three years until I ran over it one day. Uh, so there are plants that we really, if you know, if you can g get a chance, uh, go for milkweed. It's such a nectar buffet, and every insect uh, is attracted to uh, the copious amounts of the of nectar that they produce. Um, bees, tarantula wasp, which is the state insect, I think state. Wasp, I don't know, but anyway, um, and the hair streak, and I don't know, maybe that's a little predator who's come in to work on, do his place to in the food chain. Um, milkweeds, they're really adaptable uh, for every, almost every habitat, you can find one that's adaptable. The showy milkweed, which is really beautiful, and the butterfly milkweed, like a little moisture habitat, Normally, you would kind of find them in moist areas or along, uh, you know, riparian areas. Um, the broadleaf milkweed doesn't have real showy flowers. They're not hidden down in the leaves there. But if you look down in the leaves, you'll see dozens of insects in there just feasting on the nectar. But they have this beautiful leaf. I love that spiraling leaf uh, arrangement. And those grow out on the plains. Uh, the poison milkweed is in the foothills uh, and the antelope horned milkweed is uh, more of a drought to tolerant plant too. They're a little rounded uh, shrub like subshrub. Another really mega market plant is, is sunflowers. Um, 
annual sunflowers. You know, if I'm going to have one plant in my yard, it's going to be an annual sunflower. But you can't really have one if you give them a chance. You'll have a forest of them. Yeah. So <laughs> I have a little back corner and I just let them all grow. And maybe eight or ten stems will have 50 flowers blooming at, a, at the same time throughout the whole summer and into the fall. Uh, the goldfinches have already started eating the seedlings that are coming up six inches tall. They eat the, eat the leaves. I didn't know this, but every year they just descend on. So I kind of leave more than I really need because they're, they're going to eat, uh, eat up some of them. Uh, and then the, in the summer, you can see the, the flowers here with all the pollen on them. Uh, that's the disc flowers. They're little funnel-shaped or tubular-shaped flowers. And the bumblebee there with the ball of pollen on its leg. Uh, and then the billboard all around it to attract uh, the pollinators. Uh, so the, this is the common sunflower. There are several species that you can find or, or other species in the same family that look very much like it. Cowpen daisy. Um, Oh, there's a number of them. And goldenrods. It's another fall blooming plant that uh, produces lots of, lots of pollen and nectar. And they come, they're like pajamas. They come in three sizes, small, medium, and large. Um, and so you can find one to fit you know, what you need in your yard. I'll just run through real quickly a few of the really uh, food plants that are multi-purpose plants that provide food and shelter. Uh, New Mexico olive uh, in the spring, almost before the leaves come out, usually it'll have these, oops, have these flowers that don't look like much unless you're a bee and then you go crazy over them. And then in the summer it has berries that the birds like. And it's thick enough to have uh, shelter for uh, birds that are flying in. Uh, you know, they like something beside their, if you have a feeder, a seed feeder hanging up or a suet feeder, they like something close by where they can fly in and, and hide and then be sure nothing's around and go to the, go to the uh, feeder. Uh, another plant that I'd mentioned already as a, as a two-tailed swallowtail host plant is the choke cherry, and it can be a small tree or a bush. Uh, same again, it blooms very early, provides an early source of, of nectar, and then has berries in the fall, summer and fall. Uh, the chamisa is the same way. It's another fall blooming plant. And the fern bush and the shrubby sink foil are spring and summer uh, blooming plants. So these are all uh, plants that provide good shelter, they provide food throughout the seasons for wildlife. So if you can choose those, it's you do really you help the reestablish the habitat. So native plants, um, you got to have them if you want a healthy habitat, and that's you know hope. Hopefully, if we're going to seriously think about uh, creating a backyard oasis, uh, you know this is the first start. So if you have a healthy habitat, uh, then. then you'll have caterpillars. And uh, caterpillars are, you know, they're, when you go out in your garden and you find a caterpillar, instead of getting alarmed and throwing it down and mushing it because it's going to eat your plants, you know, you say, hooray, you know, let's toast the caterpillars. Um, uh, the, this one is a hornworm, which people who have tomatoes get real upset about, but he's eating a gallardia there. Uh, I don't know what this is, but he's on a purple aster. Uh, does anybody know what caterpillar that is? I, you know, most books, at least the ones I have, don't have caterpillars in it. They have the butterflies, uh, but not I many of them. There is a book out that's just caterpillars. I think the Audubon has one out for, like, North America, and thumbing through it is, yeah. yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Uh, and there's websites you can post a picture on and they'll, you know, the, the, tell you what bug it is. Uh, but, you know, not only are you supporting the gen next generation of uh, butterflies, you're also supporting the caterpillars also support, I guess I died here, 
support the next generation of birds. I don't know if you can read that, but uh, 95% of songbirds need caterpillars to raise their young. They just can't get enough uh, protein from uh, seeds, so they need, some, they need some meat protein. And a lot of birds, uh, actually a lot of animals, predators, will time their hatchlings, their babies, to when the prey species is out. And for songbirds, this is caterpillars. Uh, there was a study that looked at um, chickadees in an urban setting and they had to fly like four blocks to find a tree that had the caterpillars that were timed for their nestlings. It was a native tree, an oak tree. Uh, and so that's, they spent a lot of energy going back and forth uh, to uh, feed their young. So uh, humans have lived in this area for thousands of years, 10,000 years. Uh, you know, the Pueblo has been here for that long, for a thousand years. Uh, and for, the, for all those millennia, they depended on native plants for their food, for their uh, fiber and clothing, for a lot of it, for the tools, for implements, uh, for their medicines, and for their, their religious ceremonies. So when we have uh, native plants in our gardens, it connects us not only with our biological and wildfire, <laughs> wildlife heritage, it also connects us with the cultural heritage uh, that's been here for um, eons. So, um, so we can become backyard botanists and landscape ecologists, you know, shopping at our local uh, nurseries that provide for the uh, native plants that we can use in our yard and get a lot of information from the people that are actually growing the plants. It always helps. Um, and maybe we can even get our yard certified. It takes, I think, 50% natives and food and water and nesting sites. So, um, thank you for inviting me. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer anything, try to answer anything you might have. Uh, I have my book here if you want to look through it. It has several chapters on different aspects including wildlife, uh, gardening for wildlife and appendixes of trees and uh, flowers that attract birds and when their fruiting seasons are and butterflies and then sections on um, trees and shrubs, on wildflowers, perennials, uh, cactus, uh, ground covers, and vines. So it covers a lot of questions you might have about landscaping. Yeah.